I am chronicling music culture as a vocation. And I'm, that is an abundance that I would have never imagined. So I give thanks. So here we are. This is the Weird Music Podcast with very special guests. We got B Gets up in here. So the Up Full Life Podcast, that's that's Brian's thing here. He's done a lot of awesome interviews with similar artists that have been on, on this show. To start this off, I want to get into the nuances of asking great questions. Because, you know, the two of us have a similar role. And, and I'd love to hear your take on, on that. Like, what, what do you think are the sticking points when it comes to great questions? That's a great question in itself right there, Cam. Thanks for having me on, man. Big fan of what you do. Uh, I love this lane of podcast media, so it's dope to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's so it's like a unicorn each uh, conversation, much like our own. Like you know, the no two are the same. So what might be a sticking point for an, a musical artist is not the same for an author, a journalist. I think that like the Venn diagram uh, is asking something that your guest. Uh, is inclined to want to expound upon versus necessarily what you want to know. Mm. You know, serving them up something that's obviously of interest, but it's something that, you know, it's a it's a passion or a sweet spot or something that conveys like, I'm interested in what's beneath the, you know, generic canned response exterior when you're knocking out podcasts and you want to talk about your record, you want to talk about your label or your tour. It's like, okay. No, let's talk about something that matters. And that requires doing homework. You got to know your guest. You got to know a little something about what makes them tick so that you can maybe open that Pandora's box. And then once you've asked the question or two of that nature, I think it uh, subliminally communicates to someone like you did your homework, you're interested in things uh, that are maybe more profound than promotional. When you're prepping for an interview, what are your go-to this question is going to be awesome when they answer it. questions. It really depends. So for a musician, I like to uh, ask for the come to Jesus moment. I must do this. This is my life. Like music, whether it was like a riff from Jerry Garcia when you were 13 and you're like, oh my God, I have to do this. Or was it a public enemy cassette? Or did your parents take you to a jazz club and you heard a no name musician blow a horn? That took you to another place or maybe it was your first time on stage where the rush came and and you felt like this throne this place this seat on the stage is where i belong just asking somebody to distill that energy that moment and then uh and then take me there tell me your your moment like that with up the life podcast this might sound like bullshit but it's the truth, which is why I was, I reacted the way I did when you told me about the guest you were just on, but it was rap. So I have a really storied cosmic history with him um, in a way like that's unique that I don't really have with a lot of artists. With random rap. With random rap, right. That one, the random rap one, what I had facilitated there was so profound for me personally. And it resonated with people around the world. Like I've got emails, people I hadn't seen since this festival or that festival, people who had lost a parent, people who had been in jail or addicted to drugs or all the stuff we talked about. To be able to deliver that in podcast form, it was like, you need, this is your thing. And here mm. we are. That was three and a half years ago. Take me through some of the lessons you've learned about people, about asking questions from your podcasting journey and kind of, kind of how you've gotten better. I think for starters, like uh, when I went into it, I was green in a way where like, I didn't really understand the ability to let the other person, like I described earlier, talk about what they wanted to talk about was more like, uh, these are the things I'm interested in, in this artist. So I'm going to ask them questions about it. And then, you know, I never had like a negative or like a, a, a bad interview, but I did have some where I felt like, man, there was more there. There's more there. I just didn't lead them. And like, it's not their job to just take me there. It's, it's If I'm having them on the show, it's my job to, you know, open up the forum for them to feel comfortable to go there, if not ask directly. So what I learned was to 
to listen to other podcasts with either guests like that I was having or similar, uh, you know, because it was like an ego thing where I thought I knew everything right away. It took me a lot of interviews and then listening back and then listening to constructive criticism to see what resonated with both the guests and uh, the audience, you know, because I don't want to just make something that the audience wants because that's who's going to download, who's going to click. I'm not really making any money here. It's about like chronicling the culture, right? For me. And I would presume for weird music as well. And therefore, um, just what I want to know isn't necessarily it. It can be. And when it is, those are the best ones. But, you know, studying the guests, studying their work, reading their books, listening to their records, not just the latest one or the one you love, but maybe one that is profound to them or early for them. A great example would, you know who Chris Harford is? There's like a scene in New Hope, Pennsylvania that's in between Philadelphia and New York. And out of there, that's where Scott Metzger's from and Sound of Urchin and this whole scene that was sort of born in the Ween fans doing more shit. And Chris Harford is like, he's written a lot of songs with Ween. He's like very close with Joe Russo and Marco Benevento. And he joins J Rad and they do like Neil Young songs. Uh, Chris Harford and Almost Crazy Horse, they like to call it. Anyway, Chris is this guy that I know from this one show that I saw in 2000 in Burlington, Vermont, Winooski, Vermont, uh, where he was with Amphibian, which is like Tom Marshall, the songwriter for Fish. His musical project is called Amphibian. You know, get it? And uh, that said, he played a show and everyone in town knew Trey was going to play. And again, I was in college in Vermont. And Chris Hartford was in that band. Hartford, no T. And it just stuck with me. He performed so well. Trey played his guitar. And I wrote an article about it. One of my first articles ever, right? And then I have only intermittently heard from Chris Hartford in the interim 20 years. That was 2000. This is 2020 when I talked to him. But uh, in that time, he did a lot of stuff. He lived in London and got signed to Elektra Records and made like a sort of art house rock album, then came back, got inducted back into like the post Fat Mama, Joe Russo world, Benevento Russo duo, that whole thing. Started writing songs with Wayne, blah, blah, blah. That, now he's in a dub reggae project with Chuck Treese, who's like a legendary punk rock drummer, making dub reggae with Dana from Morphine and Marco Benevento. So this record, it came across my desk and it forced me, I couldn't just talk to him about Amphibian in 2000 and this record he just made in 2019. I digress. Uh, I had Chris Harford on the pod and other than Rab, if you were to ask me like the next best podcast, it would be him. And I've had like my heroes, like Steve Gorman from the Black Crows and Carl Denson and Adam Deitch, who's my favorite musician on planet earth and his parents, you know, like, but if you want to, the best version of what I do was Chris Harford because here's this guy with this incredible career that no one knows about and I had to get familiar with all of it we went for two hours and at the end he paid me a very nice compliment which was you know you could listen to the pod to hear it but uh that in a nutshell like uh, I guess would say would like affirmed that uh I am getting better because I don't think the random rab guy could have done the Chris Harford podcast I needed to go through all the peaks and valleys and and like the nobodies and the Carl Densons and everybody in between, you know, to get to that point. What would you say have been some of the most profound lessons you've learned from your interviewees? Uh, more like personal stories of trials and tribulations and inspiration and overcoming adversity, especially during the summer of 2020. Like I made it an intention that I, I love black music, right? I love hip hop and jazz and funk and everything I am into. Is predicated on like black contributions to the culture and that was the summer of black lives matter and and the murder of george floyd among numerous others and it was a very charged time and i noticed that our community was i mean live for live music was doing things they were doing raising money and there was plenty of sentiment but you know not a lot of people were really talking about it, really talking about it so i just had a bunch of african-american musicians in our community kim dawson carl denson dj williams and I listened. I let them explain things to me that uh, were uncomfortable to hear about their own experiences of being people of color in this community. 
we talk about lessons. I learned about microaggressions. I learned about being sensitive to things I would never really uh, pick up on uh, with regard to race and with regard to expectations and stuff that I just, that being a white male just doesn't even come across my field of vision. But now it does because it's been explained to me. And the fact that these artists felt comfortable like going there, there's some uncomfortable stories recounted. And it wasn't necessarily pleasant listening at times, but it was education or as Karis one would call it, edutainment. Because I mean, it was an entertaining podcast with some really dark detours. And uh, the lessons I learned was like, those pods are just as important as the yucks and the holy shits. Jay Blakesburg, take me to your first dead show. I mean, that's awesome, but we got to do the other stuff too. And I might've lost some listeners across that summer. I don't know. It's the only time I ever got overtly political. But I mean, Carl Denson came on the show and was like, I'm a lifelong Republican and I'm, you know, ashamed at what has happened. And, you know, basically announced on my pod, you know, like no longer running with the GOP, you know, and this is a Carl's in the Rolling Stones, you know, like Carl is travels the world and is an esteemed musician. And he talked to me about his faith in Christ, talked to me about political stuff talking to about racism with his children who were like going to college in Arizona and like asking questions. They lived in San Diego their whole lives and were just kind of in their own little bubble. And now they're at college and experiencing things for the first time. And the fact that he could relay this to me, uh, I mean, I've been a friend and fan to Carl for a long time, but I was shocked uh, that he took it there. And I learned a lot from that summer, having people of color on the pod and like, you know, not asking questions that stick, just like, giving them the mic and like sitting and listening. And I, I, those are some episodes I listened back to after the fact, because I wanted to make sure I got it all. Brian, I want to, I want to jump to the side here. All your musical experiences, you mentioned these bands, Lettuce, Random Rab, a lot of psychedelic influence. What have you come to, to realize about the effects psychedelics can have, uh, especially regarding with musical experiences? I think psychedelics are kind of like a battery in your back and also like a mind opening because the average person, when they go to a a concert or a festival, it's just something they're doing, right? Maybe throw up a tent or maybe you're just going out to the show for the night, but you're thinking about what time you got to do this tomorrow or what's due at work or whatever it is. But once you enter that sacred space of, you know, being on psychedelics for the most part, and it can go the other way. You can start overthinking everything, but usually it sort of sheds this membrane around you that normally would inhibit you from really sinking into the experience where you feel like you're the only one in the room where you're like, okay, to close your eyes or cry or just spin in circles. Um, Some people don't need psychedelics to do that. Some people use psychedelics get there. Then they're like, I don't need the psychedelics anymore. I know the pathway to Zen. I mean, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, but I think psychedelics are the super highway to that sacred space of just blissing out in the music. And it's different things to different people. And the music is different. Like the way I move to lettuce is in no way the same as I move to random rap, even though there's psychedelic music in nature. Um, it brings out different colors and emotions and body movement, you know, like, which is an art form in itself. Dancing is super sacred to me and psychedelics did deliver me to that place. But now I also go to ecstatic dance, which is a sober, silent dance. What is ecstatic dance? It's basically close your eyes and imagine a random rap show, but sober and silent. When you're in that liberated space, like a West Coast festival, which nobody ever tells you no, is uh, you can go anywhere. It's not wristbands or fucking who you know. You're just like on the land and commiserating. And like, I don't think that that's really possible without the psychedelic like revolution, like from the acid tests 50 years ago to Burning Man, like the lineage of what happens out here at psychedelic gatherings from the visual art to the music, to the movement, to the what eventually became TED Talks, but before they were just like conversations on acid, like change the world shit and like, oh, maybe we should put a bunch of people in a tent and, and talk about this. You know, like that was born with Leary and, and you know, 
Millbrook in New York and out here in the acid tests with Kesey, Neil Cassidy, all that's all that gave birth to this psychedelic community. And you see it pop up everywhere. Halloween, Fish Tour, Burning Man, West Coast Festival Culture. Like it's alive and well. It's been commodified, but I think it's alive and well. And now forget music. What about like maps and psychedelic therapy? Like I'm getting fucked on scrolling through ketamine ads on my on Instagram, literally. Like that's where we're at with it, you know. So again, it comes to back to like being responsible, teaching the youth. Like I'm lucky I had older heads who like let me know to be responsible with these sacraments, or I might be telling a different story right now. I think uh, psychedelics, for the most part, are positive, but uh, you know, they I think they stunt growth when people do a lot of them too young and in the community that we're talking about, the sort of like jam slash EDM world, it's just copious poly drugging at a young age. And that's very different than what I'm talking about. B gets Brian, man. Thank you for coming on, yeah, telling man. your stories. Anyone listening, the up full life podcast, that's where you can get more of this. We're going to have a link to that here in this episode. What, what is your ultimate goal, your ultimate vision with that? How do you see it growing and evolving this year and for years to come? Well, first, you know, I want to thank you for having me on. And this is a way that it can grow is the cross pollination with other podcasts and media forms of the like. I feel like there's a lot to be learned from people younger than me, um, which I never really felt that way for a long time. I always felt like I, I had something to teach. I've traditionally, if you look at my guest list on my pod, mostly people roughly my age or older, you know, like when the Adam Deitches are like the young people on the pod, the Nikki Glaspies are the young people on my show for the most part. I mean, I had daily bread on, I've had a few young folks, but for the most part, um, it's been a lot of like history and even ancient history. And I would love to have my thumb on the pulse of the now. Uh, and to do that, I think in the coming year and just in general, I want to have a, a more youthful energy, a more contemporary zeitgeist thing. I would have never guessed how the last couple of years would go, let alone how it would affect the pod positively or negatively. Um, but uh, in the meantime, dude, this is for the love. I'm, just, I'm a punk rock podcast, dude, DIY. I do everything myself. It's super cut and paste, budget as fuck, and I'm proud. You know, it's just the conversations do the talking and and the rest of the stuff, if it comes, great. What I will say is that it's gotten me a lot of work. I'm making a lot of EPKs. I'm writing a lot of bios. I'm doing a lot of web content, way more than when before I did the pod. What what can people holler at you for? Oh, I do. I do like feature articles for artists that want to release a project and get some shine. Uh, I can usually play something with Live for Live Music or my own site or a number of sites. And then uh, I do bios. I do like a bunch of bios. I do electronic press kits where my specialty is the, is the text, but uh, I can either put together the press kit or if they want something, there's a few different designers that I use, but mostly it's like independent artists. If you like, shit, I can't afford a PR company. Uh, I just need the basics. Like I'm your guy, whatever, whatever an artist needs. Like, I'd like to think I could help them. And if I can't, I got a guy or a gal, you got a guy or a gal. Now it's not just guys. You know, I like to be equal opportunity, love spreader. You put energy into something, you help an artist out, you get their single out, you do their bio. They're not great with words. You get them on a podcast. Like that's just good energy. Sometimes it directly comes back to you when they're successful. And sometimes it's just good juju and like we need it as much of that as we can. So if any of you listeners out there, whatever you, your needs are, I'm happy to help independent artists that are making art for art's sake. All right. Well, if you're listening to this, get in touch. Be gets up the life podcast, man. Thank you for coming on. Much love, my dude. Great to get to know you. Uh, any last final words? I really am just like grateful for any listeners. Um, as I briefly mentioned, I've been down a, a long, hard road to get here. And the fact that you were interested in talking to me, that people are interested in listening to my show, 
I'm just like, I give thanks for that. So if any of my listeners or your listeners, you know, that's my real parting words is like, I just give thanks. Like I am chronicling music culture as a vocation. And I'm, that is an abundance that I would have never imagined. So I give thanks. You made it this far. Thank you for listening. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Hemp Relief, CBD, SEM Tickets, Devil Wind Brewing and Artillery Productions. We got links in the description below. Go check out all the awesome stuff they've got going on. And yeah, much love everyone.